today I'm going to be showing off my tape interface for the XPO32. So I'm just going to load a file, save it to the tape, and load it back again. So here we are. Please ignore that folder thing, I'm going to cover that in a later episode. Oh, also, I can load a searching file, so that's a new thing. So I'm just going to load in this file. So it's loaded in. Um, so I'm just going to put this in. And I'm going to be saving it in. There. I have to plug in the board. Oh, by the way, this is the board. It, um, it's a circuit that converts a 1200 hertz signal from the tape to a zero on the output, which goes directly to the computer, and a 2400 hertz signal to a one, which goes to the computer. And also, from the computer, it just goes directly to the mic input on the tape. I'll show you how the code works later in the video. So, I'm going to plug it in. So now it's connected, and I'm just going to save this program, which happens to be located at the region 000 through 2336. Now, we're just going to go to the start of the tape and start saving. This should take a while. Five minutes later. So, now, um, it's done. So, let's eject that and go back to the start. Okay, it's rewinded. Now, let's just hear how it sounds. So, That's good. Now, we need to actually start loading this file. So, I'm gonna run the tape load command. T load. It's just gonna do as expected. It's just load from the tape. So, I'm gonna put it at a little bit below the top of the volume so I don't clip it too much. And I'm actually going to start it a little bit later in the tape. So, I've already pressed play. So, this will take a bit. A little longer than a few minutes later. Okay, it should be done pretty soon. And as you can see, it has finished. There's a little bug where it says failed. Let's hear how the song sounds. As you can see, it's worked. So, now, on to the explanation. The first step to making a new command in the monitor is adding it to the command list. This stores commands names and a pointer to where the code is. Now we can start writing code here. But first I'll explain how the data is saved. Basically works like a standard serial transfer. Everything's in normally a 1 until there's a start bit, which is a 0. Next, there's a byte with the least significant bit first. We usually speak binary data with the most significant bit first. So this just reverses it, like this. Next there are two stop bits, which are just 1s. And after those, a 1 signifies an idle state, until the next start bit. Remember, this data is represented with these high frequencies, because a cassette tape is only designed to store music and sound. Now, things are stored on tape with a header and data. Here's what the header looks like. It has a 16-bit load address, which is where the file is located in memory,
and the end address, which is where the location of the end of the file is. For example, this is 0 and 2336. Okay, so that's how the idea of that works. This first part here checks if there are three arguments. If there are not, it will send out an error and return. In the example shown before, tsave 0 is three arguments long. Next, we take the address parameters from the typed command and convert them to 16-bit values in memory. Then, we stash the values with the start address at cmt and the end address at len. You'll soon know why these variables are named this. Next, we initialize the SID. I'll explain why I'm using a SID as well. Now, press, record, and play is written to the screen, and there's a 4 second delay. This allows extra time for the user to press the record button. Then, it prints saving. Next, we add 5 seconds of the 1 bit, just to accommodate for when tape was started. Remember, this is the idle state. Now, I used the SID to modulate the tape frequencies. There are plenty other better ways I could have done this, but this is what I have at the moment, and it probably makes for the smallest code. Here's how it works. In the SID's filter, there's a channel 3 off. If this bit's set, channel 3 will be cut out from the mix. Why do we want to do that? Well, there's also an OSC3 register that stores the current state of channel 3. If there were a square wave playing, for example, that register would switch between 0 and 255 rapidly, with the rate controlled by the voice 3's frequency. We can use the strange properties of oscillator 3 to encode a 0 to 1200Hz and a 1 as 2400Hz. For the delay that controls how long each bit is played for, I just have a loop with very fine-tuning loop amount. For me, it loops 126 times, and that's for half of it. Now, the tape's mic port is connected to PA7 on the I.O. port. So, while the delay loop is running, OSC3's state is copied to PA7. The first part of the saving loop sends the start and end addresses that the user typed in. Then, we idle for a second. After that, the actual data is sent. And then, we print done. Oh, by the way, these are the subroutines for a 0 and a 1. These subroutines also run the bit delay. That's how all the timing works. Now onto the actual loop. First, we write a 0, which in this case is a start bit. Then we load the value located at the address cnt, which at the beginning is the start address, and then we and that value with the bit mask. To explain what this does, let's say that the byte that CNT points to is a uh, hexadecimal 55, which is 01010101 in binary. So we load this 55 value, and we logical AND it with bit m, which is a bit mask. At the beginning, bit m is equal to 00000001 in binary. So, the AND turns all the bits of 55 into a 0, except for the one selected by 1 in bit M. You'll see later how this sends each bit with the least significant bit first. Anyway, then we check if the result contains a 1 in it or not. If not, we write a 0. If so, we write a 1. Next, we check if the bit mask is equal to hexadecimal 80 or 1000000000 in binary. If not, we shift the 1 in bit mask left 1 bit. And then it goes back to send the next bit. As you can see, that's how it sends each bit. So once a byte is sent, bit m should be equal to 80 hex. With that in mind, once it's equal, we would start to prepare to send the next byte. To do that, we need to end this byte with two stop bits which are ones. Here's how the waveform looks so far. It's got our start bit, the byte, and stop bits. To send the next byte, we first check if we are done sending the whole data. Remember, 
len stores the last address of the file. Just the name, length. So, we compare cnt with len. If they're not equal, we add 1 to cnt, and then we send out that byte at that location. This whole process loops until we're at the end of the file, and if so, we're done! Just send out the done message, and that's it! That's how saving works. Now on to loop. Like before, we send the press play message, do a delay, and print loading. Then we read in the file size and location header, then we read in the data, that's it. I also have it print out where the file's located by printing the start and end addresses. Here's how we sample the tape data. It's basically like Ben Eater's um, RS-232 video. I'll link to the part of that video that I'm talking about in the description. So, when we play back the tape, the tape decoder circuit board will handle the tape frequencies this time. With that in mind, the type of data that we need to decode is like this. Here's how we do it. Once the start bit hits, we wait three half bits. Then we sample the current state. We wait a full bit, sample, repeat until the whole byte is read. Then we wait for the next start bit. And that's pretty much it. In conclusion, I think this is a viable option for data storage before I finish the SD card file creation and saving on the XPL. Also, I technically can speed up the transfer speed here. All I'd have to do is decrease the delay values. I might do that at some point. But I guess that wraps it up for this video. I hope you all have an amazing day, and bye bye for now.